layers of confusion and feeling overly meddled with, um, and then we'll sort of close on drip system. So we'll bring it all together. So sort of zoom out, zoom in, <laughs> zoom out again. Uh, welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much. And thank you, Teresa. So good. Cool. Um, but before we started, I know this is like Zoom land. I don't know if folks have just had their first day in school or what your day's been like. Um, I personally just took like a power nap and I'm a little dazed, but I wanted to invite us to do um, just a sort of a centering activity. So whatever's comfortable, if you're sitting, I'm a big standard, but if you're sitting like hands um, on your thighs or on your lap, sort of like giving pressure downward uh, and inviting you to do this, you don't have to do this if you want to. And then taking a deep breath in to your belly and then looking over one shoulder and sort of hunching forward or leaning forward and breathing out over that one shoulder, uh, audibly if you want. And then coming back to the center, deep breath in, pressure sort of down on our waist and deep breath in, looking out over the other shoulder, breathing out again, audibly it feels good to you. Awesome, thank you. Next slide, please. So this is a fun little diagram that I like to use in a lot of contexts. I do anti-oppression work as well as food justice work. And I just think this is really important for us to engage with a learner's brain. So just knowing that there's stuff that we know, knowing that there's stuff that we don't know, and knowing that there's stuff that we don't know that we don't know. And that's what we want to sort of engage here today as best as possible. And if you want to share any questions or inquiries or thoughts or reflections that can support us collectively venturing there, please do. Um, and yeah. Next slide, please. I wanted to begin with water. It, this is a, a topic or whatever. It is a necessity. It is magic. It is so many things. And so I wanted to ask just when, when you all think about water, and if you want to share in the chat, that would be great. But what is sort of your internal image of water? So when I say water, <laughs> where, does, where or what does your brain sort of think of? Um, and maybe head to that place. I'll give you all like five to 10 seconds to sort of think and think on it and feel on it and sense on it in all the ways. And if you want to drop in the chat um, where your internal image of water is, I am. <coughs> oh, thank you, Teresa, for that question. I want to make sure I answer that. Awesome. Thanks, Janet. I, I think of, I actually put the picture in there. So I am mostly from Taos up north. And this is a, a picture of a space on the Rio that I visit regularly. Awesome. Thanks, Sienna. And so from, from this context of water, um, I know we have a lot of folks who work with youth as well as work in the context of sort of garden and gardening spaces. And so uh, one conversation I've really appreciated sharing with youth or even adults is, um, of course, I think it's very common for us to have the, the sort of the brainstorm and the brain dream and like water, what do we use it for? How is it important? How is it sacred? Like, how is it? How do we engage with it every moment of every day kind of thing? And one question I really like to pose. Oh, thank you, Justin. Yes, swimming. Feels so good. Um, is uh, it, I, I like to sort of pose the question usually to you that like, is there anything on this planet that does not utilize or contain water? And this is this is like when all kinds of really fun and fun things and please feel free to like share loud or post in the chat if you're like this thing absolutely has zero water but basically i put an example on there because i think a lot of the places folks go is usually to like minerals <laughs> minerals rocks or um if they if the sort of fossil fuels is bypassed so, so everything really carries water so anything that we're processing obviously uh, water is a part of that process to, for cooling, for heating, for molding, for melting, for making, for growing, for breathing, for drinking, for eliminating. And um, this picture, I really love it. It's a type of mineral. It's called amphibole. 
and 2% of it contains water, um, which is very true of the vast majority of rocks uh, or rocks and minerals and the things that we probably don't think of as, as even containing water. So while water, I think, is something we talk about as precious and scarce, it is also it also carries this amazing abundance um, because it's so integral and integrated into everything and and that sort of stuff. So I just wanted to sort of share <clears throat> that reflection with y'all. <clears throat> and if anybody comes up with something that they feel does not use water on planet Earth or does not contain water, please let me know because I love this brainstorm. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, of course, in the uh, in the context of, I think we have a lot of acknowledgement of sort of the, the preciousness and the complexity of water, just wanting to visit that water um, is often used in so many ways and is also, is also often abused. And there are many, many considerations around that. Um, the majority of use in New Mexico has historically been <clears throat> for agriculture and it is it is very much um, being surpassed by industry especially fracking operations called them methane and so there's some stats on there there's lots of different stats um, and a lot of that is very much impacted by various governing uh, nations over nations over nations claiming rights and then utilizing that water as we as folks please um, and so we have sort of an explanation about like how much water is utilized by power plants, an explanation about how much water is used for one well, one fracking well. And then above that is also just sort of a reflection of that as well in folks using it to recreate, to survive for wildlife. Um, so there's many uses for it and where a lot of our water, a lot of our sort of our lack of water, that scarce resource is very much diverted into a lot of industry in New Mexico and is becoming even more and more abundant, um, whereas prior it was a lot more utilized for agriculture and then um, a lot of housing developments are in there as well from water rates being sort of diverted away from agriculture. Next slide, please. <coughs> On my slide. So yeah, uh, just thinking about the many ways for us to take care of water. Folks act as water protectors. We have the sequias, which just does a darn good job of like um, building up our water table and encouraging all the things that generate a climate that takes care. Pueblo and agriculture long before that <clears throat> still to this day practices that are just like perpetually um, perpetually important and underutilized and, and not typically being connected with those knowledges directly, but are so valuable and vital to water care, um, water conservation practices, which I think is more sort of the, the mainstream conversation we hear. Catchment is becoming more and more abundant and better understandings around that drip systems like we'll talk about today, timing our watering. This can be like seasonally or time of day and just so much more. And there's some there's some stats in there about sort of the scarcity of water, again, centering our conversation. And I wanted to invite y'all to share in the chat um, ways way that you or you would like to see yourself or folks take care of water, to take better care of water. Um, and while we think of that, Justin is going to share with us a little video from PBS um that i just does a nice job it's not all encompassing or is as, as encompassing but it's a nice video to sort of set the tone around our conversation today um and that do you need me to drop that link to you justin you've got it thank you Okay, this one and the whole thing start to finish. Yeah, I think it's like three or four minutes.
water. If you don't know where it comes from, you won't miss it when it's gone. So where does your water come from? You get it from reservoirs and reservoirs. You pump it out of aquifers, which are bodies of water under the ground. You even know how to take seawater from our oceans and use desalinization to make it drinkable. And where does all this water go? Well, let me tell you. Agriculture, it uses almost 80% of the world's water. Our nation's winter vegetables, grown in California's Imperial Valley, depend on water from Lake Mead. The corn, soy, and wheat grown throughout the Midwest get their water from the Ogallala Aquifer. Most studies show that these water resources will disappear in a few decades. And then, what will we do? To make things worse, we also pollute some of our most important water sources. Factory farms store manure in giant ponds that often leak into our waterways. The sewage contains antibiotics and harmful bacteria. Not good. Heavy rains and overwatering lead to runoff and soil depletion, as valuable topsoil, as well as fertilizers and herbicides, are carried off into our waterways and ultimately the ocean. The chemicals in these synthetic fertilizers and herbicides create dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, where no fish can live. So what do we do? Many farmers realize water is a precious resource, one to conserve and keep clean. So streams are still safe for spawning salmon. They use drip irrigation to put small amounts of water precisely where it's needed reducing water waste. And they take lessons from their ancestors. In Hawaii, that land's cultural heritage teaches its people to preserve their water resources. In fact, the word for water is way, and for wealth, it's way way. By saving water and managing their watersheds, modern Hawaiians preserve their agriculture, their environment, and their way of life. To learn more about terms like salmon safe, drip irrigation, and watershed, visit lexiconofsustainability.com. And remember, your words can change the world. Thanks, Justin. Um, so yeah, just just wanted to share that. I, I wish for someday that these like really wonderful um, videos and media resources are all centered in our region <laughs> for the time being that doesn't seem um, doesn't seem to be the case uh, before we moved forward I just wanted to ask if anybody had any um, reflections or thoughts or feelings yeah cool. next slide please um, so all of the, and just a uh, heads up, there's going to be a resource page at the very end, um, but I'm going to try to share all of <clears throat> all of the resources offered um, in one place, because I feel like it can get really scattered, and, and I'm definitely bringing in a bunch of different stuff and grateful that those resources exist. <clears throat> but wanted to share a few uh, learning connections for those those of us that are educators in the space and always looking for learning connections between sort of food systems in school spaces and at large. And um, so, one of these is the Na National Geographic uh, irrigation lesson plan that's very thoroughly outlined, pretty pretty user friendly. I think for an educator and applies to various grades. There is also um, a, a really well article. There's amazing information at the Osaki Association website always. Um, and I just felt like this article was really fabulous if it was something 
to sort of share that um, is is youth friendly, I guess. Um, and then that they want to sort of center and uplift the indigenous wisdom curriculum that the indigenous pueblo cultural center offers um this is a free curriculum if folks haven't um connected with that and it is it's extraordinary and um this lesson in particular focuses on indigenous agriculture and irrigation is certainly a conversation in there just want to want to offer those resources i want to sort of find um find some media about uh the history of irrigation and what i what i can say is i don't think we are quite at a place where we're doing a good job of acknowledging everybody that's contributed to irrigation and its vast knowledge and so these are these are some some pers some perspectives i think worth Sorry, next slide, please. It looked like my internet was unstable. My apologies. So yeah, this is some some fun photos of youth <laughs> attempting or working with drip systems. And so we'll begin with a video that sort of is addressing some of the advantages and disadvantages and says it probably better than I could. Um, and that's, do you have that video, Justin? Or do you need me to share it with you? Um, I should have all of them here in consecutive cool. Let's see. Okay. 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 Yeah, this should be it. And please let me know if any of the screen blocked by my other windows or anything. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really soothing music. I, <laughs> I dropped the I dropped the video in the chat also because I feel like the text goes through really rapidly. I myself am a pretty slow reader, um, so just in case folks didn't catch those details. So yeah, drip, drip irrigation. It is one of the many ways to irrigate, um, and the sort of. The, the context being that there are totally advantages and there are totally disadvantages. Um, <clears throat> I think a few that are regional that aren't necessarily discussed in that video where like acequias show up or in, like ancestral methods of irrigation is it really contributes to um, the building up of watersheds in, in the respect that it is encouraging vegetation along waterways and thereby wildlife and just like really increasing what some folks might call biomass um, and that is that is sort of like one 
disadvantage, I think, to drip irrigation. What I do really like about it is, especially on small scales or in school garden spaces, it is a good way to sort of um, to local to localize growth and also um, conserve water. Do a lot of those exemplary things along the way. Um, Cool. Did anybody think of any other advantages or disadvantages of drip irrigation before we move forward? Cool veins. Let's get into, oh yeah, the clogging. Thank you. Today. So we're definitely you're asking such good questions. <laughs> yeah, so we'll definitely dive into that in this next one. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to try to show y'all as as much as I can. So basically, um, there are many parts to a drip system. And today, so brought up a really important part. So I want to start with the hoses. Um, and let me know if y'all can't see this very well, because I also have my phone and I can turn that camera on and it might be a little brighter. So typically, the hose this is obviously is just a tiny portion or sample of it. I'd actually hope to give this presentation in one of the at one of the sites I work with, but couldn't find a camera person. <laughs> so, um, so this is this is a hose or tube. Uh, this is a half inch. This is what I often use. And when I say hose um, or line, I am specifically referring to sort of the. It's a harder plastic that is utilized in the fields, and it comes in different sizes. This is a half inch, this is sort of the midway, there's a three quarter inch, which is bigger, and I mostly see in larger agricultural operations. There's also these massive hoses um, that, again, for much larger operations, I'm sort of keeping it to like what I, I mean, I hope that someday there are like many acred farms surrounding garden, or surrounding schools, but. Uh, what is sort of appropriately sized, but those big hoses, and then there's quarter inch, um, which is the, a much, oh, there's water in here still, which is a much narrower. And they are usually color coded, also sort of depends on who you're buying from. I did some research when I first moved here, because I, as I shared, I'm mostly from Taos. When I first started arriving, there, I think a lot of folks carry drip irrigation materials. I very much enjoyed Ewing, which is E-W-I-N-G. They're a landscaping company. Their shop is really well set up and they're really helpful. And they're folks who are professionals who do this work all the time, whereas typically if you go to a hardware store or something to that effect, um, you're going to get some broken information, which is fine. All of us carry that, but I think they're a good place to go. So. <clears throat> Today, so I brought up a, a really awesome point about clogging. And so, if you look to the diagram on the right, it's essentially showing you systems that you can add on. Um, this is typically not going to be what you need to do with a school because those of us that have um, outlets, sorry, there's so much terminology that I kind of make it up as I go. This is the, it's a little bit of a gender divide here. But um, typically the outlets at schools are already going to have a lot of the things we're concerned about. So in that picture, it's showing you a valve, a black, a backflow preventer, and a pressure regulator. So those three things most of y'all won't need. Um, oh, thanks, Justin. Most of those things you won't need. But uh, Today, so a filter goes a long way if, if, and most most folks do. Uh, there is hard, there's sort of minerals in the water, or hard water, or salinized water. However, <clears throat> however, somebody wants to say that, and then that can save a lot because thereby you're just replacing the filter, you're just replacing filter parts instead of having to replace replace the entire system. Um, when you see this in larger operations, it's pretty hard for them to sort of keep up with that. Other, me other methods I've seen as far as like keeping hoses or keeping line uh, clean of those minerals is folks will flush with vinegar um, is, an, is another system. I've even heard of folks flushing with bleach. Not a huge fan of that, especially around kiddos. Um, but those are those are some ideas, and if folks have other ways of sort of preventing the buildup. The other way that I really prevent that is I personally do not use drip tape um, with youth or um, at schools, and I'll talk more on that later. But for me, because the line is not being as intensively 
flooded, um, there's less, in my mind, there's less opportunity for buildup versus emitters that are sort of, and whatever, I'm probably, this is probably just my made up version, but in my experience using sort of like, um, I like to use the quarter inch spaghetti line with six inch emitter spacing instead of drip, instead of drip tape, uh, because it, it is slower and I, just imagine that there's less build up. That's been my experience. There's less mineral buildup using that. My system in house I've had there for um, for four years, and it's very hard wire. It's very calcified. Um, and so far, it's been okay. And I have buddies who have farms in the surrounding area <coughs> who, who are using drip tape and are just having to replace their lines a lot more often because of the mineral buildup. And I don't have any kind of filtration system up there. So that's my anecdote to that. Um, <laughs> and that segues perfectly. So hoses, can, hoses or lines can also have emitters. Thank you, today. So that's such a valid question. Um, uh, the um, I really appreciate it. Six inch spacing. I think that great question, Janet. <laughs> I think that spacing is. Um, for the emitters, I prefer to go with six inches, but they come in all sizes, 12, 18, and 24. Usually the the, the larger spacing. Um, so, and basically what this means, because I'm realizing I might be sort of talking over, talking over people's brains, so I apologize for that. So I'm not sure you can see it. There's a tiny hole in there. That is an emitter. <clears throat> and then in six inches, there is another emitter. So if this line was laid out, it would, it would, um, release water every six inches versus 12 inches which would be this far but six inches feels like a good a good spacing um and is v is very readily available as far as resources the 12 18 and 24 is usually for uh like trees or perennials which also is an awesome thing but i'm, I'm imagining most of us are looking at sort of annuals and veggies <laughs> to answer your question janet about drip tape Drip tape essentially is a is like a uh, a half usually half inch wide, sort of similar to this one, but it's a softer. It's softer, so you can in fact I don't have any because I don't use it, but in, you can in fact roll it up like you would tape because uh, it collapses because it's not a hard plastic, and it has a different connection system. <clears throat> which is pretty straightforward and really advantageous for growers um, with large plots. And uh, I think if you if you Google drip tape too, you can also see some photos of, of it or if any of y'all live near uh, agricultural spaces that don't use flood or use it in combination. A lot of people use drip tape in the middle of your grande. <laughs> the connectors are pretty important also. So we have, um, I always mess this up. I hate, I hate that this is binary, but this is the best I've got. So this is the male, the threading, what essentially, about, about my parts. <laughs> so the, the male would essentially attach onto the female part. So it's deeply sexual and kind of weird, but anyways, that's how it's described. So this is, this <clears throat> is the male, and then we have our female or where the threading is at. So typically male, what's gonna thread on, and then we'll be threaded onto is the female. These are important things to know because these these parts actually, I don't know if I can pull them off, but these parts disconnect. So if I wanted to buy a part, I wanna make sure I'm buying the appropriate threading. There's a lot of binary in the irrigation world. Hopefully that will change someday. <laughs> um, and then other connectors, <clears throat> and we're gonna go through this like multiple times. So these don't, you don't feel consumed but there are t-shapes so this is so that the hose could run through in three possible spaces this is great for connection there's l shapes um there's also so many wacky versions of this this is an external um this is also a coupling so this just would connect so if you had to break a line or you had a busted line the all of the things that I like to use go external. I just have better luck with them as far as leaking is concerned. But there are also components that will fit inside that do the same job. And you might see these; they look they look more threaded, oftentimes. But they're also elbow joints, el elbow slash L T shape, so on and so forth. And these come in all the sizes. So um, where's my little? So this is like an example of a quarter inch coupling. <laughs> it's like very tiny and they make L's and they make T's for also a quarter inch size or a three quarter inch size. So 
you know, a little bit like doll house up to full size house um, kind of thing there. <clears throat> and then um, for stopping, there are different things that folks use. So there is, um, this is called a figure eight and <clears throat> or just an eight. And basically it allows one side of the line to go through and then you can bend it over and poke and poke it through so that it essentially pinches off the line. This is a really fancy way to do what is also just taking a stake and doing the exact same thing. If you have if you have sturdy soil, I, if you have really loose soil, this is not effective. The second the pressure hits the line, it'll blow it open, which sucks. I've had it happen on multiple occasions. Um, and then this is what's called a goof plug. So going back to there's there's something for every size. This is a quarter inch goof plug. It is <clears throat> just narrow enough that it will sit inside of the quarter inch. I'm not going to shove it all the way in there because they're really hard to get out once you get them in there. But the quarter inch would go in there. <clears throat> and then you have sort of a bigger plug. So this is definitely not to connect, but it stops the flow. And they're all pretty effective, surprisingly. Um, <clears throat> and then emitters. These are my favorite. Um, so we talked about emitters on the line. Emitter basically just describes like a way that water leaves the hose and enters your space or whatever that might be called. So this is a stick emitter. You would shove this in the ground. There's this fancy little doodad that attaches. Um, so this guy would go, oh, sorry, I'm doing this backwards. That's for a different thing. So this guy would essentially go here and then there it siphons the water out and then these uh, most these are called spray emitters most of these are adjustable and i'll show you this in one of the videos too which is super cool um and then this is this is my personal favorite actually what i like to do is i like to take this top and put it on this device um and what this guy would do is if i had a half inch or even a three quarter inch i would pierce this fella into here <clears throat> and then I can actually fan or spray directly from the line and again I've got a video sort of showing the vast majority of these things in action and then two tools that I didn't show but I just that aren't on this list but I want to share this is a cutter um and they uh are they're they're expensive and they're worth it. Um, if you just use scissors, you often end up collapsing your um, your line, which just makes it really difficult to uh, to put any kind of scissors, But it basically holds the shape so that you can cut it. <laughs> Got it. And so then it doesn't collapse it as much. So I can keep using it. And then the, especially the cutter, like with a very interested, skillful, sharp, knowledgeable adult or youth. Um, and then the piercer, also very sharp. You're typically going to poke a hole into whatever your surface is. And then that would allow me to put whatever it is I'm trying to put in there. So if I wanted to plug this guy in and then I would push the doodad in. What's nice about some of these piercers, not all of them, is it actually has a circle on the base so it can help push whatever the connector is in. This is really hard to do up in the air, but then it allows me to connect. I want to say that all of this <clears throat> takes a fair amount of muscle. Like I consider myself a pretty strong human and a lot of this stuff can be really discouraging to put together just because it's such a big muscly endeavor for your hands especially um and i'm going to try to share tips and tricks around that and also share my personal information so if you want me to come do that i will happily do that um <coughs> oh whatever you yeah yeah maybe or i see no i think it's okay um so Thanks, Justin. So I'm having a conversation. <laughs> um, 
course. I'm looking at my notes. Great. And then the next slide, please. Very cool. So, so this is basically everything, almost everything we just went over. Um, and <laughs> this is my attempt at making a chart. So please forgive me, but I couldn't find anything that had all the parts I wanted. <laughs> so, I, so I made my own. Um, but this, this hopefully, this might be a nice first screenshot. I think y'all will end up with all of the slides also, but just sort of illustrating what those various parts are, um, because I know you probably won't remember them for me showing them in this like dark space that I'm showing them <clears throat> to you from. Something that's added here is um, a group of emitters called fan emitters. <coughs> These guys are pretty cool. Again, I mostly see them on like woody, woody vegetation or perennial vegetation stuff that is going to keep growing year after year because you can do you can be really specific with it which is super cool so you can get like a one liter an hour or a two gallon per hour and those and you can stick it right on the plant or the organism even i've seen people use this to water their animals actually but um you can stick it right on there and then <clears throat> and then that allows you to control very specifically. I often think of with veggie gardens, we sort of had like dry spaces and then we want like uh, sort of stable watering in other spaces. So that's why I'm a big fan of the, the line with the emitters. One thing I didn't talk about that I really want to talk about actually, any questions or comments so far? boring you to death with all this gear talk. <clears throat> I hope not. Um, so timers, there's a bajillion versions of these. Um, and my, my experience with timers is the more manual, the better. <clears throat> so I think the tendency oftentimes is for folks to go out and buy these digital systems, which I think are really, they're really cool. I also see them um, break way more or more readily. I think part of that is because they have screens. So when it does get water, which they're supposed to be frostbitten, but when it does get water on it from snow or ice, because obviously you're going to be smart and not leave this guy connected, um, but maybe you stir it outside and then the screens will crack and then the whole system is gone. And they're freaking expensive. Um, <clears throat> anywhere from like 20 to $70 for a timer. Um, for school gardens, I'm a big fan of using the um, using sort of a single or sorry a single outlet. There are multiple outlets, and it just is that sort of like more advanced, let's say, drip irrigation systems. But I'm a huge fan, which I don't have one of these, but I'm a huge fan of using splitters <clears throat> on my. Um, well, here I can take y'all on a little wander. So, let's see. Oh, maybe I can't, Never mind. Okay, that's too complicated. <laughs> so, so basically, if I have my, we're gonna say this is my hose, I can put what's called a splitter here and I can have the timer on one side and then a uh, outlet for the hose on the other side and the splitters are great because they have um, shut off valves I'm so sorry I didn't include those. I'm going to put that as a note to myself. <clears throat> um, splitters. And yeah, but anyways, the, the timers, they're totally worth reading all of their obnoxious instructions. Like I said, I like the manual ones. So this one basically, I'm not sure how much y'all can see of the detail, but I have one dial that has how long I would like it to run for. And then I have another dial that's like, what are my intervals? Meaning, am I doing it? It says man, which means manually. <laughs> but if, if I want to do it manually, meaning I just want to like turn it on at that moment, that's what I can do. Six hours, 12 hour, 24 hour, and then however long. Um, but this is this is a nice and punchy one, and this puppy will last forever. Um, I'll demo another one in the video example <laughs> I share with y'all. Um, but yeah, and they typically need 
D batteries, you know, it's so archaic, but they, they do the job. One thing that I don't love about the manuals is oftentimes you have to actually, when you set it is the time that it will turn on. So if we really want to be thoughtful, oh, yay today. So that's awesome. If we really want to be thoughtful about uh, when we're watering, which ideally really want to encourage uh, late at, assuming it's not freezing later at night or very early in the morning. So it might just take you going one day or one time to sort of turn it in. Or if you have a really nice staff member that gets to the school early or <laughs> leaves really late, just asking them to turn it on. So that's that's maybe one disadvantage to the manuals. Whereas with the, <clears throat> with the digital, you can actually program the time that you want it to turn on. Um, and they have fancy things like they'll turn off if they sense there's too much moisture in the air, something like that. But I, I don't really encounter that in New Mexico too much. I feel like you usually have the drip on and it's not really a problem. Um, any questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts? I'm appreciating the feedback. Cool. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> cool. Um, so basically, we're going to sort of lean into the system. So now we've talked about the individual components. And then these, these are some examples of how it can go. Uh, on the left is the plot I farm in Taos. All of these were taken um, during the off season because I love being able to see the line. It makes me feel good about life. But um, the system on the far left is set up really differently because what I did is I actually ran the half inch line in a loop and then connected it with spaghetti line. And, and we will look at an installer's design strategy in just a moment, but there's just a lot of different ways. So I really encourage folks to be experimental. Um, but most of the time what we'll see is we'll have a main line and then whatever is going to be emitting will be coming off of that main line. But not all of us live in neat spaces like tight or tidy spaces like that. So there's many, there's many ways to address adapt the drip system. And Justin, if you don't mind playing the video, um, that would be great. Okay, next one. Up. I know one of these ones that started about two minutes in. Do you know if that was this one or? Oh yeah, it's not this one, it's the following one. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. This one there, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to share um, about a system I am working with regarding demystifying drip irrigation systems and start at the troublemaking and troubleshooting area, the source. This was the initial source at the school, oh, sorry, at the site of the little dog friend. And that was a little tricky because initially this, where a key would attach, was very worn down as was the key, so we replaced the key, and then eventually we also replaced this mechanism, which I don't know the fancy words because I am not a plumber. And then also the trickery we had was that this hose was very much sunk. As a result of that, we couldn't get hoses in there and or we would scratch our hands up pretty hard to do so. And then eventually the school actually shut out this water line entirely that's dry. Typically that would be full of water. And, um, we had a very nice maintenance human come on over and basically rigged a system that is connecting to a water heater. So whatever water would be going into the water heater is now going into our drip system. It smells like gas, so it might sound a little muffled coming in. We have, here is where it turns on. We have a splitter, both lines are open. I have a hose for hand watering and then for the drip system is perpetually on. One perk of this is I don't have to worry about the cold weather because it's enclosed in a room, so that's pretty cool. I love these systems. It's very simple. And then also there's a quick release on it. That's where we connect into the line. Here's our half inch hose. And if we follow our half inch hose, we eventually wander over to a T. One thing I want to share about water sources is 
I would really encourage a frost free on any sites if possible. Dealing with um, freezing pipes is a terrible thing and frost freeze are a great way to avoid it and you can make them secure as I know school sites often are very much seeking security around water, especially um, as we live in a very drought intensive state. Anyway, so this line goes one direction to the greenhouse and another direction to our outdoor garden beds. It is spring, so there's just a lot of starting, but not a lot of intensive growth, which is great because I can share the hose. Um, so basically this line comes to an L joint. This is a great way to do raised beds. This L joint is then connected to another L joint and I have it staked down and I also usually have this covered. I usually had to weed to share this with y'all. And then a connector, this is a quarter inch connector here going to a spaghetti line and the spaghetti line has six inch emitters and it's just slowly drip drip dropping down the garden. Some of the plants are pretty psyched. Some of them could use a little more, but if I take a look, um, sort of get my hand in the dirt and look for moisture, I've got moisture a full hand step down. So I'm looking at some really lush soil and that is the joy of drip systems is it supports the soil growing and also just um, increasing carrying capacity. I don't think that's the word, but carrying capacity for the water, water retention. That's what I was looking for. And if we follow the line into the greenhouse, so that's a spaghetti line. I have some of those spaghetti lines connected so they're in like a U shape and so they just feed back. Some come to an end and I just have them plugged. There's a lot of different ways to do that. <coughs> it also supports the pressure. And then in here, oh I just realized my water is off, sorry. In here we have quarter inch line, same idea for the raised bed. So we have L joints at the bottom, L joints at the top, runs through. And then there's the spray emitters which aren't spraying right now, so sorry to not show those to you. And you can adjust them. So for instance, this one I have set really low, righty tidy makes it smaller or even turn it off. Lefty loosey increases the water. If I lefty loosey it too much, sorry, blah, I'm having a little carrot intersection here. If I unscrew it all the way, which I won't show you all if I unscrew it all the way, water bursts out you can get a nice little shower, but we can typically pop them back on. There's all kinds of different sprays. And fans, this is a different one that I actually snagged from a stake system. I much prefer, and this is pretty cool. Mushrooms in a greenhouse, lovely. I like to use this spray in greenhouses just because there is better humidity and, um, and sort of overall moisture retention. Whereas when I do that outside, we have such a rapid rate of evaporation in our region. We do lose a lot of water in that process, which is a bummer. So this flooding is not ideal. Again, I've been working with sort of adjusting this as a future warm season planting site. So excited. But yeah, that's sort of our greenhouse friend and some examples of drip systems. More to come. Cool beans. Thanks for enduring my <clears throat> cinematography. Uh, so so yeah, uh, I, I see there's, a, there's, there's actually been a couple questions that I haven't addressed, so I wanted to um, address those. And I also, thanks Teresa, um, I also wanted to acknowledge, I think I said I had a quarter inch line in the greenhouse, which is not true, it was half inch. <clears throat> I'm also realizing the error of my ways in the respect that I did not show the end of the line, which I think is actually really important. I showed y'all how to sort of use goof plugs or to, <clears throat> to use the eight or to stack these. But I do, I do really want to encourage, and I think it was Michelle asked, is it Michelle? Um, asked about pressure, which is a great question. Um, and that is, uh, um, if you are taking the drip and you are running it sort of parallel lines from the main line, like so, and you can plug this and that will probably increase your pressure. If you have really amazing pressure, right? So we could have the goof plug or if we're using a, a half inch line, we can um, pinch it. If you have really good pressure, you can actually just let it loop at the end and have it come connect back. So you would end up the most bizarre attempt I'm having here. And you could have it them both connect to the same line. Um, 
So you can do, you can do all of the above. My experience of working with schools and institutions is y'all have stellar pressure. So it's usually not um, it's usually not a circumstance. In the earlier diagram, y'all saw like all of those co connective parts, like the pressure regulator and all that stuff. That's really, and I talked to the ooing folks about this too, because that was also my suspicion, but I didn't really know the, um, the, sp the specifications around it. Basically, school city, if you're on city water, you are going to have amazing pressure most of the time. If you lack pressure, that's really difficult to deal with. Um, most of the time, what you're going to be dealing with is nicely regulated pressure. If you're dealing with really intense pressure, as in your line is just blowing out or you're having it like spray sometimes and not otherwise, then you're wanting, you're going to want to get those pressure regulators. But I, I personally find looping the system or enclosing the system makes an overall pressure that I wouldn't get by doing just like lateral lines, if that makes sense. Um, but it, yes, it's pressure plays an enormous role and it's probably its own conversation. And then does that answer your question, Michelle? Cool. Great. Um, and then there was another question about gophers eating your stuff. Uh, <laughs> and that's such a good question. I do not have an awesome answer for you. Thanks, Justin. Um, what, I, what I can offer. Sorry, I had some really happy dogs that like to talk. Um, what I can say is I think that they usually really like to eat the drip tape because it's heavily mineralized and it's like a salts thing. That is one that is an anecdote to that. Um, so that might be using different equipment. Often if you have gophers or in touch with prairie dogs, um, if they're in your space, a lot of what they're liking about irrigation So yeah, I do not, I do not have a great uh, response for pocket gophers, unfortunately. Have you ever heard or seen of anyone with a thicker PVC pipe and running the irrigation pipe through that above ground? Yeah, I'm really happy you brought that up. I actually had had never seen those systems before, and when I was doing research for this, like, there's a lot of great information on doing just doing PVC, um, which is like a very accessible plumbing material uh i i imagine that's great personally um a farmer i work with here in the south valley he's he's been like converting his watering wands in from pvc so i feel like that is like a very accessible material much hardier um and can be utilized my only concern and this would just take more research for me is i would wonder about the pressure because pvc is typically so thick is all um but but yeah, I think I've definitely seen people, you can get old hoses and sheath the, like put the hose inside of a hose like you're describing. That was a great, that's a good idea. That would make sense. And then you wouldn't, you wouldn't have as much leaching, but it would just, yeah, they're just, they're resourceful. <laughs> totally. Yeah, they just uh, they like to put their mouths on things a lot and make yeah totally and they love water understandably as we all do <laughs> kind of thing but yeah those are those are good and I and I'm sorry I don't have something more and thank you for that offering that's cool nobody seems to have the answer so but your your take on it was helpful so thank you cool yeah thank you I hope it works out. you and and I guess maybe I also want to just plug in there like put something vile in there like vinegar. And like flush your system and it might gross them out honestly or like spray i've seen people do like cayenne pepper sprays or something like that that just sort of like very good thank you rad nice please I have to uh, reshare. Oh, sorry. 
so in the, in this slide um, that's coming up, basically, I just wanted to like, said a couple of things, and I just wanted to give a visual <clears throat> on those. And there's a, like. Teresa wrote up like there are amazing methods with like PVC and lots of ingenuity with like using old hoses and there's just so many ways to do it. I do think drip is way more affordable than it once was, which is super cool. Um, on the far right of this picture is a frost free. If if folks don't know what that refers to, basically what that means is is <clears throat> they plunge that that rod into the ground into the line below the what's called the. the I think it's a frost line. Permafrost is for way north. Anyways, below the frost line so that basically the water is always safe from freezing. That's the idea of it. So they're great. And then this one's closed. And I don't know if you can see, but on the handle, there's like a little hole so you can stick like a master lock through there if if indeed there's concern about the water being turned on or used. Um, at times that it's not supposed to, but frost freeze are a dream. I also find them, <clears throat> they have great pressure in my experience, because if you have enough pressure in whatever it's connected to for it to come up, it's usually gonna have pretty phenomenal pressure. Um, so those, that's something I just wanna encourage the two sites that I'm working with currently that are schools. I am I am basically asking them to hire, to hire a plumber and install a frost free. You can do this work by yourselves. I'm sure schools don't want you to do it. They're super affordable. They're like $40 for the part. And literally all they have to do is like, plug it into a line. And I think a lot of what schools do to actually have outdoor <clears throat> outdoor water attachment is far more complicated than it needs to be and usually more expensive. Um, so just to toss that out there, it's my perspective. And then the middle is a picture, which this is something I want to, I've learned a lot. There's a farmer, I used to farm in Dixon, and there's a farmer across the way and he would pump from the Asikia into a filtration system and then run it into drip line, which is amazing and very complicated. Um, and I think I think it's a little poo pooed by it in in Asikia communities and moments. And there's a lot of really good reasoning behind that. And also, I just want to I want to share some of the angles <clears throat> as we have a lot of like ancestral and historical ways that folks are and then we have these technologies sort of intersecting. But this is basically, this is um, in Mexicali, which is a town north of the border, so northern Baja. And they have a ditch, and they set up a pipe into their ditch. And then because of the way the pressure works, which this is like a whole other genius system that I still don't understand, they were able to pull drip, they were able to pull water from there and have it run through the drip and these, I think these are onion fields is what's happening there. So um, so acequias can intersect with drip systems. Most of how I've seen it done is with <clears throat> is with some kind of a hydraulic pump and a filtration system because there is a lot of sediment <clears throat> which can be a, a concern especially if we're talking about line but anyway it's pretty cool and then to the far left is a water catchment and it has um, it has drip attached to it. So folks are essentially, this catchment is raised up just a little bit from what I was reading and what I've seen, you don't need a lot of elevation to encourage gravity to water, <clears throat> especially if what you're watering is nearby to your catchment basin. Um, both of the sites I work with have water catchment. One of them have a barrel and the other one has a giant cistern, but typically just the water pressure alone inside of those systems are going to force water out. And I think is an awesome way to, to demo water conservation um, and intersecting in so many ways. Um, yeah, so that's those little fun things. And then next slide, please. <coughs> And this is, I just, uh, I put this phone here because you sort of like never can know what to plan for all the time. This is like the pile of all the stuff I initially purchased and I have like way more hose and way more stakes than I needed, but I ran out of, ran out of all of my connector, all of my L joint connectors. So just planning ahead is great and just know that, you know, there's no perfect system for any of it. I also, um, the lower right hand picture, this is from the plot of Fairman Taos. That is my, one of my barrels and I found this poor bird 
cremated, not cremated, like petrified <laughs> essentially in the algae in the bottom of that tank. So like, I never would have thought of that. So from here on out, I will always put a screen on there so I don't end up with any creatures losing their lives to my watering watering systems. And then of course, um, I have a puppy in my life and he does a really good job of messing up everything and also being adorable at the same time. So cleaning your head is awesome and just know that there will be resistance on your course. Um, we're gonna share one last video and then do some thank yous. Uh, and this this is the video, Justin, that I'd love for you to start at minute two. I, I found this just <laughs> just as I was putting this together and I just, I'm not trying to sell their system, but I think they give a really great visual that you could totally adapt for yourself um, for your for your planning of a drip system. Thanks, Justin. Plan drip irrigation by selecting the irrigation layer from the toolbar. This makes it easy to work out just what you require before you start installing it. Most drip irrigation systems start with three things at the water source. First, a timer controls when the watering should happen. Typically this will be 10-15 to 15 minutes in the morning and or the evening. Second, it's a good idea to include a water filter to eliminate particles that can clog the drip irrigation system. Third, add a pressure regulator to prevent the water pressure from exceeding what a drip irrigation system can handle. Typically this will be around 10 to 30 psi for a small garden. Next, the supply lines for the water need to be laid out. Half inch polyethylene supply tubing is usually used for this as it's easily attached to walls, cable tied to pipes or buried under pathways. It's important to identify any sharp bends as this could restrict water flow if the tube kinks. You can use 90 degree elbow fittings to make sharp turns and prevent kinks in the supply line. T fittings can be used to create a branch line off the main supply line. Finish each length with an end fitting. Once the supply tubing is in, it's time to add the drip line. This is connected by punching a hole in the half inch supply tubing. A length of quarter inch tubing is attached to one end of a transfer barb and the other end of the barb is inserted into the hole. The quarter inch supply tubing is run to the area to be watered, then another transfer barb is used to connect the drip line to the quarter inch supply tubing. Several different patterns are commonly used for laying out the tubing. For plants in rows, quarter inch drip line is run along the beds, kept in place by U-shaped hold downs every three feet or so. For more densely grouped plants, you might choose to snake the drip line along the bed. In the garden planner, you can draw this by holding down the control key on a PC or the command key on a Mac to add lines for each quarter turn without needing to pick up the drip line tool every time. Then curve them using the middle handles. For square or circular beds, a spiral layout can work well. Containers on a patio or deck can also have lines branch out to them. In each case, the rule of thumb is that quarter inch drip line can only feed around 15 to 20 feet, depending on the emitter spacing. So if you need to go further than that, you'll need to run another length of quarter inch supply tubing instead. Larger bushes and trees will often have their own supply line and use either half inch emitter tubing, or if they're irregularly spaced, you can use half inch supply tubing with emitters inserted into it at the right places. Circle the tree so that the roots are encouraged to grow out rather than stay in a tight root ball. It's fine to put a layer of mulch over the drip line just so long as it doesn't become buried into the soil which can cause back suction of dirt potentially clogging the system. These simple design principles work well for small to medium gardens with an equivalent of up to about 6, 4 to 8 foot beds. For larger gardens, you'll need to divide them into separate systems, often referred to as zones, where you run more than one supply line and may use more than one timer. When your design is complete, just head to the Parts List button where the garden planner has calculated the number and length of parts required. Add around 10% to the totals for any length of tubing to make sure you have a little spare when installing it. With your plan and parts list, you'll find it much easier to put in place a reliable system to ensure that your plants get the regular watering they need.
thank you so much. <clears throat> I need to learn how to put music in the videos. That would be so good. So yeah, just just a fun example and who doesn't like listening to accents. Um, anyway, so, so that's just, again, like so many ways to do this. Uh, but yeah, I think I think the way that they sort of plotted it out made sense. The, I think my only objection is they use quarter inch line from a flat line to feed into a raised bed and I just, I don't trust that that pressure would be very great for a quarter inch line. I think you would want to have a half inch line and have the quarter inch come off of that. Um, anyways, that's my mumbo jumbo about that. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, and I would love to hear any questions, comments, needs. Thank you, Justin. This is my information. Um, I will also put it in the um, chat box. Please don't hesitate to text me or email me or call me. Um, like, no joke. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I just really appreciate sharing the space. And I apologize for any messes I have made and also really appreciate um, like sharing the space and hearing the questions, but just wanted to make room if, had, if folks had questions or concerns or comments or needs, et cetera. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you all. And I learned some more today. And it's my first time giving this presentation. So if some more feedback shows up or something, please feel free <clears throat> to share it with me. But I, I like I like to do it as thoughtfully and provocatively <laughs> as, as possible. Um, yeah, so have a great rest of your day. We're ending some minutes early, which is fine because we just wanted space for Q&A and happy, happy everything to everybody. And thank you so much, Justin, <laughs> champ. <laughs> yeah, here. So just to check it, we're gonna get back in the main room at 510, is that the plan? I think so. And I think that's a, that's a separate um, connection. Yeah, so if anyone wants to wrap up. Plus, I heard there's a drawing for prizes. So, so. Oh, yes. Say, get your prize. <laughs> like Enjoy them, for sure. Also, thank you all. Take awesome care. Thanks, Teresa. That's great feedback. Are people still entering? Mm -hmm. Wrong place. Oops, sorry, I guess I need a different link. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, checking the agenda for the, maybe it's the same one as before, maybe not, I'm not sure. Okay. But I'm gonna close this one for all the...